Well, thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to address this distinguished gathering. Ten years ago, um, I co-authored this book on the Millennium Development Goals, and I also had the privilege of leading a project on the MDGs at St. Paul's Cathedral in London, which incidentally employs well over 200 people. Um, and one of the things we did was uh, wrap one of those Make Poverty History banners around the famous dome of St. Paul's. I couldn't get on the internet to show you the picture, but if you know St. Paul's Cathedral, one of the great landmarks in the world had this wonderful banner, Make Poverty History, around it. At the time of this energy for the MDGs, uh, one of the main drivers for development was, of course, civil society, of which religious organizations were regarded as major players. And it was for this reason, and to my absolute delight, that the UK government's Department for International Development, DFID, was willing to support our work, as indeed was the United Nations. And both the UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, then Gordon Brown, and the then Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, they both came to St. Paul's to address thousands of people uh, on the MDGs. Now, if I was to do the same sort of work today on the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, uh, as I did uh, for the MDGs, I think I'd be putting my energy into working in another area. I'd put it into business. This is because the SDGs have been framed in a way that recognizes the potential for private enterprise to alleviate poverty. And more fundamentally, I think we need business to work for and not against the world's poor. This shift in the SDGs, I think, represents two things. First of all, the disproportionate contribution of business activity in China and India towards the MDGs. And secondly, the recognition that multinational companies wield enormous power and influence in the world today that transcends national boundaries and can the control of any single government. So if companies aren't on board, we've got a problem. And if we scan through the SDGs, we'll see that there's plenty of scope for business involvement. Just to give you some examples. Goal 8 includes full employment for all and the protection of labour rights. People not in education, employment or training. Goal 8 also calls for decoupling of economic growth from environmental degradation, which clearly poses lots of challenges for business. Goal 9 calls for sustainable industrialization, raising the share of GDP generated by industry in the least developed countries. In other words, in least developed countries, promoting industrial enterprise. Goal 12 includes halving per capita food waste, which clearly has implications for food producers and distributors, as does goal two, which calls for the doubling of productivity of small-scale food producers. Goal seven calls for fu fossil fuel subsidies to be phased out and for the balance of energy supply to shift to renewables. Goal six, for universal access to water and sanitation, has implications for the water and utilities industries. The fishing industry is affected by goal 14 concerning marine conservation. And right throughout the goals, there's an emphasis on removing subsidies, such as fuel subsidies uh, and fisheries, and liberating trade through the involvement of the World Trade Organization. I could say more, but that gives you a flavor of how important engaging with business is if we're going to achieve the SDGs. And because of this focus, the United Nations has provided guidelines for businesses, particularly multinational companies, to implement the SDGs, what they call the SDG Compass. It's a very logical five-step approach. So step one is for businesses to get themselves just familiar with the SDGs, what they are, what they involve. Step two, then, is for, to define within a business what their priorities are by analysing how far they've already gone to uh, work towards the SDGs and where their activity uh, works against the SDGs. And, um, and then they then have to assess that, that level of alignment. And then step four, that's step three, then step four is to integrate sustainability into their core businesses 
and governance practices. And then step five is to make sure that this is reported on so that they become accountable to their, share, to their, to their stakeholders in terms of delivery. Now this all makes huge sense, but there are three enormous hurdles to overcome. First and foremost, of course, the SDGs aren't legally binding. They're voluntary, they're aspirational. And implementing them may well incur large costs to businesses, affecting them at the bottom line, affecting profits. So actually getting buy-in to the SDGs is a challenge to business. The second hurdle, I think, is what we might call tokenism. One of the problems that we've already seen that's associated with corporate social responsibility and trying to get businesses to implement ethical codes of practice is to ensure that they actually have bite, that they are not simply ethical window dressing. And I think to do that really does mean that you have to align your management objectives with your ethical objectives. If you don't, management objectives will always take precedence. And I think the third big hurdle to overcome is short-termism. We can't rely on, uh, we, having, uh, if development requires a long-term commitment, it requires future vision, whereas business is often driven by short-term objectives. So we've got to have a mindset change here. Now, history suggests that if businesses are to contribute significantly to the SDGs, then several things need to happen. First of all, there needs to be incentives and opportunities for business within developing areas. That's the carrot approach to it all. But there also needs to be a stick approach, because in terms of international agreements between governments to regulate business activity, so that it does become truly aligned with the goals. Ending fossil fuel subsidies is an obvious example of this, because we simply can't rely on the market forces alone uh, to reduce poverty. Strategic market interventions are also required to point businesses in the right direction, to give them parameters to work within. But there's a third dimension as well, which is where I believe religions have a particular role. In his encyclical, Laudato Si, published earlier this year, Pope Francis said this, business is a noble vocation directed to producing wealth and improving our world. It can be a fruitful source of prosperity, especially if it sees the creation of jobs as an essential part of its service to the common good. But of course, if one reads the whole of Pope Francis' encyclical, it's quite clear that this description is the ideal and not the reality, because in practice many business, businesses are far from noble in their vocation. And while producing wealth might be an objective, improving our world is not necessarily so. Neither is the prosperity that it generates necessarily fruitful. And Pope Francis is especially critical of multinational companies on their effect on the environment and as a consequence on the effect of some of the world's poorest people. So there's a role, as there's always been, for people of faith and goodwill to do what they can to promote business for the common good. So what can we do? One way, I think, is through ethical investment. As I said in the introduction, for a number of years, I was an advisor to the Church of England on ethical investment. And I was delighted when our advisory group switched its policy from recommending that the church disinvest immediately from firms it deems unethical uh, to engaging with them to take on senior management, to talk to them, to ask them to change what they do with disinvestment as the last resort. Jesus meeting and challenging sinners and tax collectors, not ignoring them, that was our, our inspiration. Shareholder pressure, particularly from organizations that have some moral weight, some moral clout, such as religious organizations, can have leverage when it comes to these discussions with business. I've also worked as a priest among those working in the financial sector in the city of London, one of the world's major financial centers. Now, the city doesn't have a good ethical reputation, particularly after the uh, financial crisis of 2007. But what it does have is a number of people of faith and goodwill who work 
within the industry at all levels. And I've tried to engage with such people at a senior level, through, partly through the book I co-authored on ethics and investment banking, hoping that senior management would take on ethics and spiritual issues uh, seriously, take them seriously. The projects I've been involved in are very small scale compared with what's required in terms of creating a mind shift. But the encouraging thing for me is that there are senior figures within the city who do have a sense of vocation, who do see their work in terms of contributing to the common good, and who are open to dialogue. And what's true in the city is, I'm sure, true in other sectors, which is why I think that initiatives to get people to think about how their faith relates to their working lives is vitally important. And so a group of us clergy in the city um, were inspired by the Woodstock Business Conference that was established by the Roman Catholic Church in the US to set up a similar project uh, in the UK, the Faith and Work Forum. And there are many other such initiatives that are hopefully having some influence on businesses. What's also encouraging is that some city firms are taking religion seriously for cultural reasons. They want to understand what makes their highly international uh, and diverse workforce tick and how to be sensitive and supportive of their cultures within the workplace. And only last week I was told of a partnership involving a leading international finance company and an in international interfaith organization. And this project is about to be launched and spun out to the company's clients. Now these sorts of projects will inevitably enable people of faith to help shape business and ethics and corporate social responsibility from the inside. But I want to draw to an end by saying I don't want to be over-optimistic about the roles that faith can play in influencing business, certainly within the city. In 2011, St. Paul's Institute at St. Paul's Cathedral commissioned a survey of city workers called Value and Values, Perceptions of Ethics in the City Today. One of the most striking findings was that 76% of city workers disagreed and most disagreed strongly that the city should listen more to the guidance of the church. I want to put that in context against another survey in the UK um, on reputation about religion. In another national survey um, recently taken, only 20% of respondents regarded the Church of England, that's our national church, as a positive voice in society. And of that 20%, only 16% of those said it was because the church had an ethical voice. Now I realize this is uh, England and we can't extrapolate to every part of the world. But at the very least, it's a salutary reminder that people of faith should be aware that taking the moral high ground or to assume that others will see them as ethical role models is not necessarily going to work. Some religious organizations, including my own church, need to regain trust within their societies because without that trust, any sort of fruitful engagement with other uh, groupings is simply not possible. So to conclude then, I believe that people of faith have much potential to contribute to sustainable development through the SDGs. They can contribute, as they've so often done, uh, through their own initiatives, through joint initiatives with other organizations, through lobbying, through lobbying governments and others, through education. But there's also, I think, the opportunity to engage directly with business and to address fundamental questions about what is business for, and to try to shift mindsets away from the sake of doing business for the sake of business or for the sake of making money, to business for the sake of human flourishing and for the common good. But this, though, is far from easy, and in the process, some faith organizations will need to regain the trust uh, that they once had and build credibility on ethics before they will be taken seriously. Thank you. <laughs>